My name is Dr. Lisa Port. I'm the Chief of Breast Surgery at the Mount Sinai Health System and the director of the Dubin Breast Center and the author of the New Generation Breast Cancer book. Well, of course, um, breast cancer is predominantly a disease of women and about 99% of all cases of breast cancer are in women. Um, in general, women of all ages are vulnerable to breast cancer, although it is predominantly a disease of older women. So the vast majority of women, um, the vast majority of cases that we see, about 75% are in women above the age of 50. Um, it is important to know that men can get breast cancer. It's very rare. So um, male breast cancer makes up about 1% of all breast cancer diagnoses and less than 1% of all cancers in men. But it's very important that they know that um, that can happen as well. And awareness is key. Signs and symptoms of breast cancer can be very, very varied. Um, of course, the number one sign is a lump in the breast of any size that's new. Um, of course, not all lumps are breast cancer. They can be other things like uh, cysts or benign tumors. Um, but when someone feels a new lump in her breast, um, it's very important to get that checked out and not just assume that it's um, one of the other non-cancerous things. Um, there are other signs as well. Um, nipple discharge, especially if it's bloody, can be a sign of cancer. Um, skin changes, either what looks like reddening of the skin or a rash um, or skin pulling, what's called skin dimpling, where when a woman raises her arm up, she sees um, some puckering of the skin. Um, and there can be other things too, a rash in the nipple, changes or scabbing of the nipple can also be a sign of breast cancer. Um, a lump under the arm where the lymph nodes are can also be a sign of breast cancer. So um, women have to know what's normal for them and call attention to their doctors or other healthcare professionals if there's something that's new, um, either in the breast or under the arm. Of course, um, the number one way of picking up breast cancer early is through mammograms. And mammograms are recommended as the uh, screening tool of choice for women over the age of 40. Um, mammograms do a great job of detecting breast cancer early, but of course they're not fail safe, no test is. About 10% of breast cancers that are diagnosed are not seen on a mammogram. So ultrasounds can also be an important way for screening. And of course, physical examination um, can be important as well to detect any changes to the size, shape, uh, conformation of the breast. So in general, breast cancer um, can't be prevented in the general population. There are definitely lifestyle factors that can decrease the risk of breast cancer or increase it on the other end. So um, the two main lifestyle factors that can increase the risk of breast cancer is one, heavy alcohol intake, um, and two, um, body weight. So um, being overweight or obese can increase the risk of developing breast cancer. And conversely, alcohol intake um, in moderation or none at all and maintaining a healthy body weight can definitely reduce the risk of getting breast cancer. Um, other factors that can increase or decrease the risk of breast cancer are less um, a part of a woman's control. So for example, um, we can't control as women when we, the age at which we develop our periods, um, having uh, an early onset of puberty or your periods can increase the risk of getting breast cancer. Um, also late menopause can increase the risk, but again, these are things that are not in a woman's control. Um, so it's the, the lifestyle factors that can um, really uh, increase or decrease one's risk of getting breast cancer. Um, for our high risk patients, patients with genetic predisposition, there are things we do offer them 
that can reduce the risk of getting breast cancer. For example, our highest risk group, those with the BRCA mutations, where women have a 60 to 90% chance of getting breast cancer in their lifetime, lifetime. We actually offer those women what's called risk-reducing surgery or risk-reducing mastectomy, where we actually remove the breast tissue and the tissue at risk for getting breast cancer. We don't offer this, this surgery to women at um, lower risk levels um, because it is a very big surgery, but very big undertaking, very disfiguring, all of those things. Um, there's also a medication that's called tamoxifen that can reduce the risk of getting breast cancer. Again, not recommended for women in average risk groups, but definitely something to be considered for women at increased risk for breast cancer. So the BRCA genes, one and two, are genes that we all have, but a subset of the population inherits what's called mutated copies of these genes. And when that happens, that means these women are at increased risk for developing breast cancer up to the 60 to 90% range. So really high risk of developing breast cancer. Um, also a higher risk of developing ovarian cancer up to a 40% risk and other cancers as well. Um, men also who have the BRCA gene are at risk for cancers, prostate cancer, pancreatic cancer, and even male breast cancer. And so our newly launched BRCA program is to provide our patients, both men and women, with basically guidelines and a comprehensive and holistic approach to BRCA monitoring and care. And so what we do is um, women who, for example, are newly discovered to be BRCA positive would come in and have a comprehensive consultation with a breast surgeon, with a gynecologist, and with all of the relevant specialists to her care and the imaging associated with that for screening for breast cancer, screening for ovarian cancer, and any other cancer she might be at risk for. Similarly, similarly for men, um, we have a prostate cancer specialist. We have a pancreatic cancer screening specialist. And so what we do is for each person who um, wants to um, be involved in this program, we customize and tailor recommendations for screening based on the sex of the patient, the age of the patient, and what they're at risk for in their life for, um, for future cancers based on the genetic predisposition. Um, there are so many. We have about 20 clinical trials going on here at any given time um, for women with breast cancer. Um, there's a lot going on relative to newer treatment modalities. For example, we offer a treatment for appropriate patients, appropriately selected patients called intraoperative radiation therapy, where typically radiation treatment is three or four weeks after surgery and is long and arduous. Um, for appropriately selected patients, we're actually giving their radiation treatment in the operating room. So imagine if you could go to surgery for your breast cancer and wake, wake up having had both the surgery and the radiation part completed. Um, so that's one thing we're very excited about. Again, our BRCA mutation uh, program to really educate patients and um, empower them to understand um, what the approach appropriate options are for BRCA mutation carriers. Um, everything from risk-reducing surgery to just monitoring and surveillance. Um, we are um, doing a lot of research also in fertility preservation in patients with breast cancer. And one of my colleagues, Dr. Christina Welts, is extremely interested in spearheading that. Um, and, and a variety of other things, new treatment uh, pathways and new treatment offerings. Um, they're all really what's going on here. And so really um, options for treatment are changing 
all the time, and we have more to offer our patients than ever before. Sure, so the pandemic has definitely affected screening in that we are seeing tons of patients who missed last year um, in their mammograms altogether and are now coming in two and three years uh, after their mammogram. For those diagnosed with breast cancer, certainly there, there can be um, a later diagnosis um, and the need for more aggressive treatment given that delay. Um, we've done an incredible job here, I think, in keeping people safe um, and in making sure that um, our patients who do come in for care, especially those who are immunocompromised from chemotherapy, are as safe as possible. Um, we practice social distancing in our waiting rooms. We don't allow a large number of patients and their family members to come in either to sit with them or to be part of the consultation. So we're very, very limiting in terms of the number and extent of exposures to our patients. And of course, you know, as per the um, New York State mandate, of course, now all of our healthcare professionals and all of the people that our patients encounter are vaccinated. Um, so we're very proud of all of that. I, I think my message for our breast cancer patients is um, don't put care on hold, mammograms, treatment, et cetera. Um, it is very safe to come into medical facilities now, um, probably more safe in some parts of the country than others that are still experiencing a very high rate of COVID um, infectivity. Um, for right now, it's very safe at Mount Sinai. And we, you know, we do recommend coming in for treatment and don't put, not putting your screenings on hold. Um, early diagnosis is key and can um, translate into higher cure rates and also um, higher cure rates uh, with less interventions and less intensive treatments.